Hey, and welcome to, according to Pete, it is a dreary, rainy September 5th in 2018, which uh, rarely happens here in Colorado. Usually that's accompanied with a snowstorm or ice or stuff like that. But what a great day to talk about solar panels. I got a little one right here. We started selling these flexible ones. They're really cool. Um, I really wanted to talk about uh, what they are, how they work, and I'm gonna cover all this stuff. I really dig how solar panels work. I like the mechanism. I think that's really interesting. But we're gonna talk about the chemistries behind it, uh, the way they function, some of the accoutrements you need if you're going to use a solar system. So if you're somebody who's like just getting into your first project that you wanna put out in the field and you wanna do a solar thing to kind of power your thing for a long time, Thing time. This is going to be the show you're going to want to watch, right? Let's dig it. Okay, to just cut to the chase, a solar cell is a PN junction, okay? But it works in reverse the way that an LED works. Now, if you saw the episode that I did on LEDs a uh, few months back, I think it was, um, you know that um, when you get an electron, it gets enough energy, it jumps the junction, and then it recombines. And when it recombines, it releases a photon of a very specific wavelength, okay? And that's what we see. That's how an LED works. Well, a solar panel, sorry, solar cell, I'm being very specific about this. A solar cell works in the opposite way. So let's say, this is, this is my cross-section of a PN junction here. You might think I'm gonna do it that way, I'm gonna do it this way. Uh, so you get, uh, you got your P material down here, you got your N material down here, and now, y'all remember what happens in, <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all, y'all know what happens when you get N material and the P material together? What happens is you get a depletion region, okay? You probably, if you, even if you haven't been to college, you probably know something about this. So what you get is um, a region in between here, and the electrons will migrate up to the top, and the holes will migrate down to the bottom. Now, okay, here's the thing. When you, when you subject this to sunlight, yes, it's the sun, woohoo, what happens is you'll get photons of all frequencies coming down, but the ones at a very specific frequency, specifically equal to the band gap of the material, what happens is photons will come down they will hit an atom here and they will cause um, an electron hole pair to be created. And so what will happen then is the electrons will migrate up and the holes will migrate down and that's current flow. And that's how a solar cell works. Now, to complete our generalized form of a solar cell, what you'll have is uh, like a conductive substrate of some kind that the P material sits on and you will have like, oh, let me show you this. So on a solar panel, this is one of the flexing ones that we sell now, uh, you see all the fingers that are kind of go up in there? That's the conductor across the top of the end material and that collects electrons, right? That's the N. And so you get current flow, right? And let's see, so that would be a negative, that would be a positive. And there's our solar cell. Now, what I also want to tell you about this is um, a solar cell, this one, it's a field of very active research, okay? So there's a lot of different materials that are being used. Almost always in commercial purposes, you're going to see silicon. Um, and we're going to talk about that more. Uh, and consequently, what happens, uh, the upshot of that is the voltage that a solar cell creates is about 0.5 to 0.6 volts, right? Well, Pete, well, I'm putting my ohm meter on thing and I measure voltage. Okay, you gotta, if you're putting an ohm meter on a thing and you're measuring voltage, you got another problem. What I'm saying is, if you measure like this one, it's not gonna tell you half a volt. And that's because what they will do, and I'll explain this more later, they string cells together in series and parallel to create panels, like a panel, that has a greater capacity for voltage and current. Okay, well, again, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so a little bit of an addendum on what I just said. Um, now, the whole story about solar cells is going to be about efficiency, right? Um, now, on one hand, you go, like, it's free energy, man. Who cares about the efficiency? Well, you'll see why it matters. Um, 
but uh, you, you realistically only get about 10 to 20 percent generally. A lot of times you don't get that much out of a solar cell. And the reason, there's a bunch of reasons why, and I'm going to preface this. The first is the band gap, okay? We just talked about that. It takes photons of a very specific frequency to knock loose a uh, electron hole pair and cause current flow, okay? The star sitting up in the sky puts out a hell of a lot of different material, okay, at a whole lot of different frequencies. And we only see a tiny little piece. And so consequently, you don't get very much of the, star, of, the, of the sun's power. Now, to be just completely blunt, you know, you get like one kilowatt per square meter out of the sun, right? But that's at all frequencies. That, right, remember that efficiency is power out equals power in times <laughs> efficiency, right? Well, the power in is all of that. And if you can't see all of that, you don't get nearly the amount of power out that you want. And so, consequently, what happens is you get solar panels of very large physical size, right? Remember we, when, I, when I said just a few minutes ago, uh, because these things only make half a volt and they only put out so much current and they're very inefficient, you have to put a whole slew of them together to do anything interesting, okay? So that's kind of the story of why efficiency matters and why we talk about it so much. All right, let's move on. Again, we're only talking about uh, silicon solar panel, solar cells, uh, because these are the ones you're most likely to encounter, right? All of the other stranger materials like germanium, those are uh, areas of research. You don't see them very often. They're more expensive to create. Um, but there's three types of silicon that you're gonna run into. Uh, the first is monocrystalline. Now this is a single crystal grown from a seed into a long cylinder, and the cylinders can be quite large. Um, and they're, 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 they're kind of a giveaway in that the corners are cut and they look kind of octagonal, uh, or sometimes they just take sections of it, but you can tell if it's got like a funny corner cut, it's a single crystal. Uh, they have the highest efficiency of all of these, and they are the most expensive to create. Now, just to give you an idea, I got one of these that was in my pile of junk. So you can see on this guy, it's got like the corners cut, dead giveaway that this is a monocrystalline solar cell, solar panel. This is a panel, right? It makes more than half a volt. It's a panel. Okay, the next one down, polycrystalline. Now what happens here is they take the silicon and they melt it down and they cast it into a block and then they control the cooling. It is slowly cooled so that crystals will form within this. However, it's not a single crystal, right? Now, when you look at these things, it's, you've, you've, you've probably seen these and gone, wow, that looks really cool. Because it's like, you'll have a thing and then you'll see like jagged edges through here. And it's like kind of a funny blue color, but it looks really cool. Those are the ones that are polycrystalline. Um, they're cheaper to make than monocrystalline, and uh, they are in the middle of efficiency between mono and the last one here, which is amorphous. Uh, think thin film, think non-crystal, okay? So the way this is created is a uh, chemical vapor deposition onto a substrate, right? So it's, it's the cheapest to make. Uh, there is no crystal involved, or very small crystals involved. It is the least efficient, but it's also the cheapest. Now, what kind of efficiency are we talking about? Well, okay, if you go to Wikipedia, which I'm going to steer you at in a little while, um, it's got this really sweet chart that'll tell you like really big numbers, like oh, over a monocrystalline you can get up to 20, <laughs> these sound like big numbers, 26% efficiency, and you'll never get that. Realistically, um, the things you can buy are gonna be in, in like in the teens. If you get to like high teens, like 17% efficiency, you're doing probably pretty good. Poly is gonna be more in the 10 to 12 or 13 percent efficiency, and amorphous is gonna be like sub 10, okay? But it's free energy, right? Well, sorta, we're gonna talk more. So beyond what we've already talked about, um, 
with regard to efficiency. Some other things, there's, there's a bunch of loss mechanisms that are involved here. Um, and a lot of them just take little bits away, like early recombination, uh, black body radiation, and between like the grade of silicon and uh, uh, the band gap issue, only getting a certain frequency of light that makes it work, and the other issues, your theoretical maximum efficiency for a single junction, that's foreshadowing right there, uh, for a single junction monocrystalline solar cell is going to be just around 34%. If all the stars are aligned, the moon is just right, the tide is all great, that's what you might get. You'll never get that. Um, anything that does not go into current gets dissipated in the solar cell as uh, either heat or it passes through. Okay? This leads up to the next point. In effort to attack the number one loss mechanism, which is the band gap issue, uh, what is done is that you will get like several junctions stacked on top of each other. And now, of course, just th three of the same wouldn't do you any good, right? It, it, you're still doing the thing. So what you're going to see is all three of these are made from different materials. So you're going to see stuff like you see in regular, like germanium, indium, uh, gallium arsenide, uh, stuff like that. Stuff that will have a different band gap so that you get more of the spectrum, okay? So if it doesn't get caught here, it'll go here. And if it doesn't go here, it'll go here. And so the net result is you get a whole lot more power, right? Now, what are we talking about? Um, I think the maximum efficiency achieved by this method is something like 46%. Doesn't seem like a great number, but that's a vast improvement over what it was. Um, alas, the cost of manufacturing these things is not cheap, and you will probably never hold one in your hot little hands. Uh, these are going to go to like Ball Aerospace <laughs> or Lockheed, you know, somebody that's going to put a whole bunch of money up and then send them up into space. That's probably where they're going to go. Um, but theoretically, not theoretically, uh, this is done to increase the efficiency and you need to know that. But you're probably never going to get access to these because these are like special order things. So what are we talking in terms of uh, performance for a solar panel? Uh, and I want you to shift gears now. Don't think in terms of a solar cell, think in terms of a panel. You are not going to buy a single cell. You can't do very much with a single cell unless you've got a tiny, tiny project. Uh, you're going to buy something that's going to make a lot of power. More power than you need, probably. Um, a solar panel is rated in terms of its open circuit voltage, its short circuit current, and its maximum power out. And oftentimes what you will see is a plot that looks a lot like this to indicate what the performance looks like. Now, what this tells us is that under full illumination, right, you've got the sun right above your solar panel, best it could ever be. What it's gonna tell you is that, or what this tells you is that for very low current draw, you know, you've got your maximum voltage. This is this will be open circuit voltage, OCV. And this will be short circuit, uh, current. Uh, okay. Um, and so if you're only drawing a little bit of current, it's going to maintain its voltage pretty well. And the more current you draw, it comes down, comes down, comes down, until a certain point it's like, I can't do it anymore! And then it just goes away, okay? Um, now, what you also see on this plot that I haven't drawn yet is max power out. So what you'll see is that uh, the, 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 there will be a line it will go up and then it'll tank and, and it'll, yeah, those will line up. And over here you've got like, you know, wattages indicating. And so there will be this one spot where your power is maximum and that will become critical. And the reason it's going to become critical is something else that this tells you that may not be obvious. You cannot realistically run any circuit off of just a solar panel, okay? This is not a well-regulated thing. For various current draws, you'll get different voltages out, and that's unworkable. And then there are the physical limitations of 
this mechanism at all. If it's a cloudy day, if somebody's standing over your project going, oh, how does this work? Your power is going to go away, okay? So a solar panel becomes part of a larger system, a solar system. I've been waiting all day to say that. Okay, let's talk about a solar system. So as I've been doing this, I've got two different things in my head. Uh, number one is I want to tell you the generalized form of uh, a, a, a solar power system. <laughs> you can't avoid the word. Um, but at the same time, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of projects that are smaller in scale, but this is generalized to the point where it applies to a large scale and a small scale. Um, where you're going to find greater disparities is... Uh, in price of the components. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So basically, um, right, you can't just use a solar panel. I got my solar panel and it's making power and I love my solar panel, but it's not really well regulated and some guy's standing over it and he's like, what do you got going, man? And he's blocking the sun and that's making me mad. So what you also need generally is a thing which is also attached to another thing and then you get power out here. Now what these things are, this is a charge controller controller. And the reason you need a charge controller is because you are actually going to run your stuff off a battery. Batteries work really well for long periods of time, right? And if you calculate whatever your thing out here, let's say ground, here's my thing, load. And if you calculate your current draw per day versus the size of the battery versus the charging ability of the size of your panel versus this guy, and we'll talk about all the components in more detail in just a sec, then you can have this thing sitting out in the field, okay? Now, as to the uh, individual components, uh, I'll start with a solar cell, uh, a solar panel. Um, now, Oftentimes, they've been saying the price per watt for solar has come down and down and down to make it a viable competitor to natural gas, all this stuff. Okay, cool. The thing is, when you get to smaller and smaller solar panels, they don't become equitably cheap, if you take my meaning. Um, in fact, they maintain big prices as far as I can tell, right? The bigger panel you get, the, the cheaper you can get at economy of scale, yada, yada, yada. Um, but for like a little guy like this, you're still gonna pay, you know, 20, 30 bucks. And so while I can tell you about prices that you're going to encounter for specific items, what you're gonna see is small ones are gonna retain higher prices. You're, and, and I don't wanna give you a specific number, but you're gonna look at the number, you're gonna go, that sucks. Um, so be used to that. Uh, and you know, you just set up your voltage and your current rating, the, you can do that. Now, um, oh, I gotta go to another panel here to talk about the charge controller and the battery. So let's do that right now. So, charge controller. There are two different charge controllers you're gonna run into. Uh, one is called PWM and one is called MPPT. Now PWM, you probably already know as pulse width modulation. Okay, and the other one, MPPT, is Maximum Power Point Tracking, and I'll tell you what that means in a sec. Now, if you look at the circuits for these things, which I did, what you will find is actually, um, let me draw a little more space here. Uh, you've got uh, input from a solar panel, and this is a little bit generalized. PWM, looks like it goes there. And then you get uh, a big old inductor there and a big old capacitor there and your output to your load there. And then there will also be a diode here, okay? Now, you know what that circuit is? That is a buck regulator. And you got, you got a higher voltage here. You've got a PWM signal here. And you, I'm sure I've done a video on this. Why haven't you seen the video? Um, but this is what a buck regulator looks like. Um, and this is how they use PWM to charge a battery. And if you compare a circuit for a PWM, quote unquote, charge controller versus an MPPT charge controller, you will see 
both of the, you will see a circuit very like this. Actually, in the MPPT, you will also see uh, a boost configuration that it can optionally take on as well, so that it it can it can tailor the input voltage to the output voltage in order to charge your battery at a specified current. Okay. So really, and, and down here, I call it PWM in quotes because really, they're both kind of using PWM. They're just a little bit different. Now, MPPT, maximum power point tracking. What it does, right? You remember the plot I just showed you where you've got the thing there and then you've got the power there and there's max power. Okay, well, because the sun goes away, because dude stands over your project and can't see the sun, um, it's really advantageous to be able to have a charge controller that can tell where you're going to get the best bang for your buck and tailor the system on the fly to get at that point, right? If the sun's going away, your voltage is going down. So you can only draw so much current in order to get the maximum out, right? That's how MPPT works. Now, an MPPT controller can be 10 to 40% better over a standard PWM controller, okay? Um, now, does that matter? Well, that depends, <laughs> it depends on two things. It depends on how much cash you got, and it depends on the system that you're trying to put together. Um, oftentimes for the smaller MPPTs, I've seen them in like the $100 range and up depending on specs. So, like that. The PWMs you will see for about a tenth of that, typically. Uh, so, if, if, getting, if getting the best bang for your buck in your system isn't that big of a deal and you gotta save money, you can get away with not this. Um, okay, now, what kind of battery are you going to use for your solar cyst? You can just... Somebody's gonna be waiting out in that parking lot to beat me with a sack of potatoes when I get out of here. Um, the batteries that you're gonna find, if you're using an off-the-shelf uh, charge controller, be it uh, PWM or MPPT, uh, you're probably going to be using some form of a lead-acid battery. Uh, SLA, sealed lead-acid, tend to dominate the market. Um, flooded, AGM, which is absorbed, I can't remember the acronym now. Um, it is uh, a, a fabric that goes between the panels of the cell that wicks the, the electrolyte up into it so that you have a reduced amount of electrolyte. In case there's an accident, absorbed g I can't remember what it is. Um, gel cells, right? These are all versions of lead acid batteries. Uh, why? Well, they tend to be very tolerant of adverse conditions, be it weather, be it your circuit design, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, right, so you can abuse them, and they'll last uh, a really good long time. Uh, lithium? Well, okay. Now, um, the scale of your project, the scale of what you're doing uh, is going to come into play here. Now, if you're building a large system, something that you want to power like an RV, right? Or you've got a boat. <laughs> you, maybe you've got a boat, I don't know. Um, and you're, you're looking to, you know, keep, keep power while you're running your stereo when you're not on the lake. And so you're going to build a thing that's going to feed the battery that's already in the boat. Well, that's going to be a lead acid battery almost certainly. Um, but the lithium is going to happen more often on smaller things. In fact, we even sell the Sunny Buddy, which is uh, an MPPT track, tracker, it's an MPPT uh, controller uh, for a 450 milliamp LiPo battery, or more, or more. Uh, it'll take six to 20 volts in, it'll uh, give you a two amp load, it'll support a two amp load for about 10 minutes on a 450 milliamp battery. But, um, if I was gonna, if I'm making like a weather station or, or something that I've designed to be low power, I'm probably gonna go with something like this. The controller, I think it's like 25 bucks on the website. Um, and that'll do me. Now, of course, I'm also gonna be, you know, weatherproofing the bejesus out of this thing because in my experience, lithium batteries do not do well at low temperatures. Uh, the chemistry has improved, the, the technology has improved over the past few years. They are better, but, yeah, we'll talk, we'll talk. Now, 
I have done much less legit stuff with regard to solar. Um, a few years back, I made uh, a system. I was doing uh, tracking devices on train cars, right? So it would have to go out in the field. It would have to stay there for months at a time, right? And so I needed to make this thing as cheap as possible and as reliable as possible. And so what I did was I had like, you know, my 12 volt solar panel to charge controller, that guy, to a sealed lead acid battery out to my load, just like I described. This guy, float charger, okay? Lead acid battery, float charger. What's a float charger? Well, there are complicated float chargers, and then there's a the float charger I made. And all it was, literally, was an LM317, <laughs> right? That, and there's a cap to ground, right? Look at that, and there's your solar panel input. Uh, and that goes to the battery and that goes to the load. Now I probably, if I was smart, I put a couple of diodes in here. I haven't, I may have been relying on the LM317 to keep current from backing up into the uh, solar panel, uh, but I haven't read that data sheet recently. I don't remember, I might have put a diode in here. But my point is, I did this, right? Now, 12 volts here and this battery was six volts, right? So at full charge, I'm dropping a whole bunch of wattage on this guy, right? So this was mounted on a fairly large board just so it could get rid of the heat. I didn't care about the efficiency. This thing would work in the field for months and it did, right? And so lithium, eh, you know, you can buy a small SLA battery for like five bucks, you know, five amp hour, small guy, six volts, five bucks. You can put this thing together for like two. And it stayed in the field. I mean, I had failures, but that was because of my bad code. <laughs> Who can blame me? But physically, I mean, this thing worked and it worked well. So my point here is that you don't have to get freaky about it, but you know, if you're gonna use lithium batteries, you're gonna have to be careful about the charge characteristic, yada, yada. But if you're using lead acid and you're just throwing stuff out in the field for a while, this'll work. It'll work pretty well. Will it be efficient? Well, no, but it doesn't have to be efficient. I mean, it's out in the middle of nowhere. It's fine. <sighs> That's it. That's where we're gonna wrap today. So you need to you need to check out some of these flexible solar panels that we got. I've I've got like a slew of the samples that we had, and I'm gonna do something like destructive and stupid with them, and I can't wait. Um, so that's on solar panels, right? Uh, I'm gonna point you to some materials, but there's not, it's a fairly mature technology, so there's not, I, I didn't see a lot of other reading sites that I would point you at beyond a couple of the interesting Wikipedia ones. So those are the ones I'm gonna steer you at. And uh, also a little search for solar products on the site because um, we got some cool stuff. Tends towards the smaller range, obviously. If you're if you're looking to like power your house or something, you're probably going to go to Home Depot or Lowe's or yeah yeah yeah. Um, but if you're looking to do projects, you're probably coming here, and we have got the stuff to set you up. So um, until next time, thank you for coming. Thank you for checking it out. And uh, yeah, I don't know what's coming up next. If you got any comments, put them in the comment section below uh, and uh, give us a shout. If you've got any ideas for videos you want to see, let me know that. And I'll see you next month. Bye. That's going to be on the front of the video, isn't it? Like, <laughs> everything is going to go totally smooth. <laughs> Which is my middle name. Pete, totally smooth. Doctor. I'm going to have to do this again. Cut it, cut it, cut it, because I'm pretty sure I mentioned. Maybe I should just, yeah, let's do an outro now. <laughs>